So I'd like to talk a bit then about how we view acquisition costs when it comes to flash memory based storage. And you know, nothing proprietary about this table. It's on our website. It's been on our website since 2010 on our basic analysis on how we deal with acquisition costs. Because historically, flash memory has been cost prohibitive for most customers. So here's how we, how we dive into it. We look at the four points that lead to acquisition cost. The hardware itself, the capacity overhead, the software licenses, and at the very least, that first year of maintenance or support. So when we looked at a f traditional 15,000 RPM array, and here you know, we looked at some data from the current enterprise storage providers, we found that most of those systems were around $6 per gig on a, on a purely hardware basis. And their capacity overhead was oftentimes about between 30 and 40%. By the time you accounted for RAID, uh, their parity schemes, if it was a dual parity scheme, hot sparing, file system, snapshot pre-allocation reserve, you know, all that stuff. If you bought 10 terabytes of hardware, you usually ended up with about six or seven terabytes of actual usable capacity. So that, ba that basically is costing you $3 a gig on that front. Is yeah. the only difference between Nimbus and a 15K array on the capacity overhead then that you now have a snapshot reserve? That is a large portion of it. Uh, the other difference is uh, the actual Nimbus operating system itself does not take any of the drives in the okay. system. Uh, it's common that usually three drives in a system are reserved for the OS. We don't do that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't understand why people still do that when you can, for $200, put a pair of little SSDs into boot from. Uh, maybe the stack is fat, but even those SSDs are getting big. You, you could imagine they could fit on there. Yeah, you, you yeah. Know, a mirrored pair of 128 gig drives. Right, Should be enough. Like Clarion booted off of three 9 gig drives. Yes. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, but th that's that's a big part of it. Also, I think our file system too, because if you if you Look at the way our file system operates. We can create very, very large file systems as opposed to, say, a 16 terabyte limit. So there's some artificial capacity loss there. Uh, then there's the software licenses themselves, uh, and then the, the first year of support. So when we, when we added all this up for conventional 15K disk array, you know, we found that you know, customers were spending kind of in the low teens per usable gigabyte. So when we went about our model, we said, look, the hardware obviously is going to be a huge challenge to building a cost-effective flash system. If I had to do this with off-the-shelf SSDs, this $10 number would probably have to be a $30 number. But by building our own flash modules, sourcing silicon directly, leveraging merchant silicon flash controllers, actually building our own drive, we're able to get this cost down pretty considerably. Then we have slightly less capacity overhead for the reasons we just discussed. And we don't charge anything for the software. And because our product tends to be actually rather reliable, you don't have the mechanical components of disks that can fail, we have very inexpensive support contracts. So we're actually able to get to a net cost per usable gigabyte that's awfully close to 15K disk. Yes, Nigel? Two questions. Yeah. Um, do, do those numbers at the bottom change much if you increase one year support to say a minimum of three? Because I would never buy anything with one year support. Yeah, and if I did, my traditional vendors would then nail me when I came and asked for an extension on that. The multi-year support contracts are cheaper per year from us than the single year, so it would actually get even, even better for us. Okay, and the more interesting question then, is there really that much margin in um, the SSD vendor market out there, like the S-Techs and the Samsungs and the people, that you can go and make your own cheaper than you could buy from them. And I suppose off the back of that question as well, um, what actually do you, what, what do you do in building your own SSDs? Because, you know, it comes in a standard two and a half inch carrier and what have you. What do you actually do over and above what do you just buy? Sure, so yeah, two questions. So the first question is, you know, absolutely there's a huge difference. Um, the memory itself right now on the market is under well under two dollars a gig. So if you look at you know even a, a stack you know two hundred gig drive, you're saying that that should be a four hundred gig drive, give or take a little bit. It's a thirty five hundred dollar drive. So is an enormous price difference there, and it's maybe just a, a point in time issue, and that could go away. And you know like I talked about with Howard at the beginning, you know if it does go away and it gets reasonable, if it's you know ten or fifteen percent. More than happy to hand off 
that function to a partner. But for where it is today, there's just no way we would be able to be cost effective. Now, keep in mind, our strategy is a bit different than the other flash vendors. You know, what the other flash vendors are doing is taking off the shelf SSDs. And they're saying, we're going to make it cost effective through DDU. That's how we're going to make it cheap. But our problem with that philosophy is the varying, the variances of DDU ratios. And it's impossible to promise a customer a price if it's based on data that you don't know anything about. So our goal was to say, let's just get the box costs as inexpensive as possible, Any, anything further on DDU, money back in your pocket. <coughs> your second question on do we do anything uh, special? So uh, a couple things. Um, the first thing we do is in the DRAM component that's in here that helps power that uh, distributed cache architecture. There's some firmware optimization uh, involved in that. We are not doing an ASIC in here. We are leveraging Merchant Silicon, but a portion of the firmware functionality supports that DCA capability. Uh, the other thing, uh, too, is just in uh, achieving the, the density. Um, you know, traditionally, it would be very tough to kind of hit this ter one terabyte, well, 800 gigabyte uh, visible. Uh, density in a two and a half inch form factor. There isn't any other uh, SSD on the market that has that. Uh, I think the biggest ones are around 512 gig in a two and a half inch form factor. So there's a little bit of packaging uh, that's gone into that. But you know, as a company, I will tell you this is something that we're doing today, whether we have to do it in the long run. I know there's a b fairly big debate, and, uh, and Robin was, I think, also raising this on Storage Mojo about you know, dry form factors or non dry form factors. How do you go about doing this? From my perspective, I'm not sell selling a drive. I'm just going to use whatever it gives me the best rack economics in, in a, on a per U basis. That's, are, that's it. Are you seeing similar failure rates in your drives compared with the controller? I, I assume you're just buying a controller. Other drives that are using the same controller? So can, can you just repeat that question yeah. yourself? Yeah. Because people on the camera can't hear you, hear the questions. Oh, that are coming in. That okay, coming I, in, yeah. I'll make sure to repeat that. Then. Yeah. So the question was, um, what are the failure rates like on our modules, and are, are they similar to the failure rates of a uh, off-the-shelf SSD that's based on the same Merchant Silicon controller? Uh, I believe our reliability is much better, uh, really, for, for two reasons. One is we use EMLC memory as opposed to MLC memory. So the memory itself is six times, six to ten times more durable than what you get with MLC. Uh, the second piece is where... And the additional RAM makes up for the slower write speed? That helps. Well, his was more reliability than performance, but yes, that, that helps. Also, the over-provisioning size with us is much bigger, 28%. Most off-the-shelf SSDs are done at five, between 5 and 8%. Uh, and there's actually a third piece, uh, and that's the, the power capacitance. Actually, most uh, off-the-shelf SSDs do not bother with any sort of power protection uh, in the drive. Uh, we are selling it to customers that you know, need to know that there's end-to-end -end data protection, which means we have to provide our own power protection, which we do. Uh, most off-the-shelf drives do not. And that's what through a flux capacitor. <laughs> <laughs> a tantalum capacitor. Close. <laughs> because flux capacitors are still prohibitively expensive. They're just too big. We couldn't shrink it down from the uh, car form factor to the uh, <laughs> drive form factor. That's a lot of <laughs> What's that? 1.21 gigawatts. Yeah, and getting the fissile material uh, to power it also proved challenging. Uh, just skip to the IAEA. second generation. You need, you need the distribution. <laughs> What's that? Just, just skip to the second generation and put your trash in the back. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Recycle banana peels. The, the banana peels, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so this is how we looked at acquisition costs. Then, then there's sort of a whole other argument around what I'll call effective cost. And you know, here we'll, we'll take into you know, some notion of, of deduplication ratio. So as I, as I talked about before, the Nimbus solution is around $10 per gig on the hardware, which allows us to get, if you want to assume a 5 to 1 dedupe ratio, well, fantastic, I'm even better. Now I'm $2 a gig. If you're in a use case that's getting 10 to 1 dedupe, well, well, now I'm a buck a gig. Maybe, maybe now I can even take on nearline SATA with an all-flash product. And I, I want to just point this out because it's a bit different than other vendors that are out there talking about $5 per gig. It's important to note that they are talking about $5 per gig with an asterisk next to it that says with 5 to 1 dedupe, which means that their hardware is actually $25 per gig. So again, I think this is why I was so adamant yesterday about why purpose-built hardware really matters for Flash. If you just take off-the-shelf servers, it will be very, very difficult to uh, make yourself performance and cost competitive and density competitive in the long run. This has allowed us to have a significant kind of cost of goods advantage over the off-the-shelf guys. But 
At the same time, I want to temper the enthusiasm over these, you know, fairly high dedupe ratios with some data from NetApp that puts most dedupe at around 32%. So before we all start drinking the dedupe Kool-Aid and viewing that as the uh, fundamental driver of flash adoption, you know, again, we have the functionality, but I think from a reality perspective, we just need to be careful of what we promise the customers. That's why we say, pay the price, whatever dedupe you get is money back in your pocket. Okay. Great. So. With all this combined together, if you take cost and then take our performance figures and our power consumption figures, this is really the one slide that will really capture the, the Nimbus value proposition in a nutshell. If I only had one slide to show a customer, I would show them this, which is that today they're using 15K RPM storage systems for their primary storage. They're maybe getting 20,000 uncached IOPS. They're maybe getting 500 megabytes per second of performance. Their average latency, while it could be as low as 5 milliseconds, oftentimes could be as high as 30 or 40 milliseconds. So let's say 15 millisecond average latency. If they were to move to Nimbus, we're going to increase that IOPS up to 800,000 IOPS. We're going to increase the throughput up to 8,000 megabytes per second. And we're going to consistently deliver a sub millisecond, actually less than 200 microsecond latency, uncached. At the same time, we're going to take power consumption for, say, a hypothetical 10 terabyte system over five years from 13,000 kilowatt hours down to 2,200. We'll take the BTU cooling from 44,000 BTUs down to 7,400 BTUs. We'll take rack space down from 4U to 1U. So significant OPEX and data center efficiency savings here. And finally, we'll do it at an acquisition cost that is close to identical to what you're paying today. Oh, so well, this does assume some short stroke. Uh Getting these performance numbers? Yeah. Uh, well, either that or, uh, yeah, 10 terabytes, that's probably does it <coughs> assume. So 20,000 IOPS would be awfully good. That's probably a cached I.O. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't yeah. see any anytime soon you get. Yeah, it'd be 100 drives. It would be right? 100, right, it'd yeah, be 100, 100 drives. For you. And so that would be. 60 terabytes. So maybe I should just take this down to say 5,000 if I'm yeah. being uncached to uncached. Yeah. That's brutal to the drive guy. But so I'm giving them more credit, I guess, than they deserve. Well, it, you know, <laughs> because now we start going, but they're giving you more capacity. And well, but here, this is assuming at, say, a 10, 10 terabyte. Terabyte configuration. Well, configuration. you're not being brutal because every drive array is cache fronted anyway. So exactly. You're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So. Yeah, it's all about IO density. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I mean, the choice but today, the choice between flash and spinning disk is is ionet. IOPS per floor tile. Well, IOPS per gigabyte. <laughs> uh, which one How, you know, what what's your demand in I, in IOPS per gigabyte? There's a point where if it's low, 7200 RPM drive is the right solution. Right. And there's a point where if it's high, flash is the right solution. Right. And where that line is depends on which two particular solutions you're looking at. And that's exactly why we see it that way, sort of a flash tier, a bulk tier, and that's how it goes. Yeah, unless you're at the, you know, nimble, tin tree size. The all-in-one kind where, of hybrid solution. Where one, you're buying one unit, and you can get a hybrid solution, that's a good idea. Yes, Robin? Um, I, I, I've been looking at TPCC, uh, you know, benchmarks lately, and, and actually a lot of the... Um, uh, there's there's a, a lot of uh, flash-based arrays out there uh, in the last two years, um, or that not necessarily totally flash-based, a mix of flash and disk, that are getting performance in that, you know, two-tenths of a millisecond uh, range um, average on PCC. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of wondering you know, how, how realistic the, the 15 millisecond number is. Uh, because if, if you are able to do a mix of flash and fast disk, and you're able to get a similar uh, latency, you know, it's, I don't know, I mean, it seems reasonable to me. I, I don't think you'll get it to an uh, all flash system. Sorry, a similar latency to what? Uh, a similar average latency yeah. to the Nimbus. 
to the Nimbus. <coughs> and I, I'm just looking at TPCC, and, and you know maybe that's representative of your workloads, and maybe it's not. You know, but it, it's just a it's a it's a it's a set of data that a I've been looking at, and b you know there's voluminous reports on, so you can go see how maybe they gamed the system. You know, some people set up you know hundreds of volumes and you know all this stuff that nobody can do in real life to get these numbers. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, it just, I don't know, just, you know, for me, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, quite play. I think the rest of the numbers seem pretty reasonable, but I, I just bring that to your attention. And can, I, can I ask Robin, so sure. were you suggesting that a, a traditional array that's got a mixture of solid state and HDD in it? Well, okay, might, if, if you look at... TPCC benchmarks, basically there's only been like one in the last two years that, that was all disk. Right. The, uh, the rest of them are a mix of flash and disk, and some of them are all flash. That's right. Yeah. right. So, and I don't think there's one from Nimbus, or that uses Nimbus, but there are ones that use uh, you know, Oracle with the Sun, whatever it is, FS 5100 and the violin. Uh, but all of them, you know, have have average response times that are, you know, in the in the neighborhood of the latency they lay out there. Yeah. So, so I guess then, the, so the comment for the people who aren't here, question is, can a hy some hybrid systems have been posting TPCC numbers that are seemingly comparable to what we're posting for the latency figures? Right. So I think though you you answered your own question to a degree, which is you have to look at the configuration of hardware in these hybrid systems that's getting to these numbers. Uh, and I've looked at a lot of that data too. I mean, when you look at, for example, EMC's numbers based on a hybrid VMAX, you know, involves something like 70 SSDs, you know, 615K drives, and 2,000 SATA drives, or something of that nature, to get to those numbers. Uh, here, we're talking about doing it out of a $25,000 2U box that draws 300 watts of power. Um, I also think too, it really depends on the workload. You know, those SSD-based solutions that are doing the hybrid, they're getting some acceleration out of reads, but they're getting nothing out of writes. So if it's a benchmark workload that's heavily read-oriented, then it's possible that you know, if they're getting consistently high cache hits out of the SSD tier, that they can post good numbers. But you know, the workload in a virtualized and a real-world environment, I think, is much more distributed, more like 60-40 read-write ratio. And those systems on writes are going to go right back to being, you know, waiting for waiting for media. Whereas we're still going to be flash at that 200 microsecond latency. Uh, yeah. I don't mind saying that in the real world, I've worked with most of the vendors that have these sublong mixing SSD and what have you in it, and the latency does come down when you turn things like um, dynamic tiering or adaptive optimization, whatever you're calling from whichever <coughs> vendor comes down but it's I, I see it at about 20 to 30 percent when I look at the, at the latency graphs they drop but it's nowhere near that so if it was 15 milliseconds it might drop to 10 on average uh, and that's at, at more than one company that I've worked at as well and these are just general type workloads so I, I think there probably are somewhat artificial those TPCC configs okay. Uh, I think also too, and this is one of the discussion points I put up later. I hope we get to is that you know the hybrid solution, I, you know, is is fitting in a market right now in that mid range where people don't want to invest in flash and in SATA. But my personal view is the further cost reductions of flash that are imminent will actually encroach very much on the price point of these hybrid solutions. In fact, we've won deals against hybrid vendors that are 10% SSD, 90% spindles where we actually beat them on cost at the same capacity point. And, and, and we still are further cost optimizing our, our products. So th that's where I, in one of the comments I raised yesterday, I think that's a point in time solution. I don't think that's a long term viable solution if you can deliver an all flash system. Those prices are coming down. And that's with me not even relying on dedupe. If I do then dedupe on top of it, now I'm well below where, where they play. So. Um, you know, I'm not terribly bullish on the hybrid space. I think it filled a void left by Equalogic and others exiting the market, but I, I, I don't see it as a long-term strategic mid-market play with all flash solutions price coming down. The numbers you were using for the 15K array, 
Mm -hmm. Is that a specific array you have been looking at, or is that an average of severals you have been looking at? Uh, it's two. Can you elaborate on? I can't. <laughs> I would love to. I really, really would. And uh, I got myself in a little bit of trouble earlier when I did, no. so I, I'd rather not. But it's two very it's you know, large, it's recognizable one vendors. or multiple. Yeah, it's, it's two. It's two. Yeah, okay. so one sort of block storage array and one uh, blue say unified array. Uh, <laughs> that's like a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, that's on you. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, talk a little bit about target application. So really the, the use cases we're, we're gearing this toward, any, anything primary storage really, but the, the first adopters so far the last two years for us have been virtualization shops doing server and desktop virtualization and database clusters and database consolidation. Uh, we also are beginning to see some activity in e-discovery and analytics, not for the bulk data, but for a lot of the more uh, transaction-oriented data. And then in the HPC space, you know, it, it's we are the only NFS uh, and SMB-capable uh, all-flash system that I'm aware of, at least, um, that can scale with HA without mirroring. Well, you don't have to remember. We'll take it offline. I think I know who you're <laughs> referring to, and they're not. But if there's someone else, then I'm happy to be educated. <laughs> Um, but having that, that HPC space, um, so that can be oil and gas, uh, chip design, EDA companies, you know, a lot of them have built large performance NFS infrastructures that just have tons of spindles. They don't need the capacity, but they're just buying spindles. Uh, we're, we're starting to get some good success there. Uh, some recent customer wins. Uh, we'll be elaborating on who these names actually are over the next few months. <coughs> Uh, but one of the top virtualization companies in the market actually uses our technology to run their own internal uh, VDI uh, infrastructure, uh, which is, a, is a, I think, a very good complement for us. Uh, one of the top news companies uh, that's pretty heavy on Oracle databases with direct NFS is one of our customers. Uh, even in the, in the media market, uh, one of the top post-production companies is using our solution because they like that in a very small footprint without a lot of spindles they can get a lot of throughput. Tom. Yes. Can I ask, are these, are these wins, are these going into production environments? Yes. And are these, they're, they're paying out for stuff, these aren't, you know, um, here's one and let's, because you talked about the NetApp effect earlier, of when some engineer would have one on his desk back in the day and then suddenly the department's data was running on it and it worked its way into the production environment. Yeah. Are, are these proper, you know, you, you've won an RFI, whatever it is, people yep. have, yeah? Yeah, no, we're, yeah, we've been shipping for two years. So these are core production deployments. Uh, a number of these customers, like eBay, I mean, they went public saying they deployed 100 terabytes of our product in production. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're, we're generating considerable revenue. Uh, and the company is profitable too, so yeah, we're, we're definitely selling them. Yes? So you're saying we're shipping for two years now? Mm -hmm. How do you handle uh, cross-generation if you get to a next generation of your product? How will you handle that? Will, will it stay online? Do you have to do rip and replace or not? So we, we've already actually had, we're in our second generation now already, so we've had to cross this road. Uh, software is identical between the first gen and the second gen. Uh, the uh, flash uh, trays are identical between the first gen and the second gen, so we've, we've kept them homogenous in that respect. We focused on improving the compute capability in the box, but kept the software and the flash, which is where the bulk of the cost is, the same, so customers can leverage that. So we actually have an upgrade path, for example, for our customers that bought our Gen 1 S-Class back in 2010, that want to buy our Gen 2 S-Class now in 2012. All they have to buy is the shell, and the, they can just move the flash modules from their first unit into the second unit. But you're unit. not expanding throughout generations in the same system? Uh, when you say expanding? Adding Gen 2, adding Gen 3 to the same group. Well, it's not scale out. No. And the scale up is new. So it was just, this was, is in its second generation, so it's kind of, you got to replace it, it's just one yeah. thing anyway. Yeah, yeah software though, is, and, and really, you know, 90% of the cost is that flash, and that, that just moves over. So okay. right now, whatever the max capacity of that box, that's as much as you can do. Like, so if you had an application that needed one gig more, you're out of luck. Is that uh, what you're saying? The, on the S class, the S class itself is, is expandable, but it's not as expandable as the E class. 
So the S-Class can expand 100 terabytes, basically eight shelves for the S-Class. So yeah, if you fill this thing up and you need one more gig, you can you know, buy another shelf, connect it, and expand it. I think that's where he was going, though, is if you have eight boxes, I want to get a Gen 3 in there. Can I take a Gen 2 out, put a Gen 3 in, and carry on? The expansion closures are, uh, yes, are, actually, are all SAS interconnected. So yeah, they'll, they'll transition right over. Absolutely. And, and also, you can actually mix and match capacities. So when we came out with our first ones, they were only 2.5 and, and 5 terabyte units. Now we have the 10 terabyte unit. You can mix and match the capacity types in the same stack in the same system. Okay. The, so, yeah, I'm sorry. The, you were talking about VDI. Are, are people using it uh, straight up, or are they like having one box for without dedupe and one box with dedupe? Typically, they, they, they're getting one box straight up, and if it's only for VDI, they're leveraging dedupe. If it's for VDI and a couple other things, they'll create two file systems on the Nimbus and do VDI on one file system and whatever the other app is on the non-deduping file system. Okay, um, we talked about some of our government uh, customers, so some DOD customers we have, some customers in supercomputing. Uh, next week, we're actually announcing a pretty large win with uh, one of the key electrical uh, electricity companies, which we're kind of excited about. Actually, we found it sort of humorous that they were buying our product and being a reference for our product because we cut their power consumption about 80%, which I suppose is not good for their business. But nevertheless, uh, it's, uh, that they were uh, deployed our product. So eBay is one of our uh, most referenced customers. Uh, we first uh, did a 2.5 terabyte unit with them uh, about a year ago. Uh, today, uh, they're uh, well above 100 terabytes of deployed capacity. Uh, all of our technology with them sits on iSCSI uh, in a virtualized environment uh, around VMware. So they're you know, putting virtual machines, uh, running production virtual machines off of our storage, multiple S-class units that they've deployed. Uh, obviously, they have lots of different uh, storage vendors. It's a, it's a large company with, with, uh, with huge amounts of storage capacity. But they did look very carefully at the caching and the tiering approach. And to the question earlier about is caching or tiering you know, maybe good enough on a latency perspective, they found absolutely not. It really was not good enough. And that particularly uh, made itself known when they were doing cloning or provisioning operations. Because when they do a clone or they do a provision, it's basically a, almost a 100% right operation. No amount of uh, flash accelerator cards or SSD tiering that only accelerates reads is going to help you there. Um, they also found that not only did we help there, but we also cut the power consumption pretty considerably, almost 80% compared to what they had before. And we also shrunk the amount of rack space that they needed. A lot of what they're doing is around this concept of, of pods, if you will. And we see a lot of customers doing this. Sort of what NetApp calls a flex pod or what uh, EMC calls you know, the, the, the VCE uh, product, and, and now they've got a new, a new flavor of it. But a combination of compute, storage, top of rack networking, and hypervisor, and then simply <laughs> duplicating, you know, sort of duct taping that together and duplicating that over and over to scale their infrastructure. So that's uh, kind of the manner that we're finding with a lot of, a lot of different customers. And you know, in addition to all these operational gains they were able to get, they found that our solution on a per gigabyte basis was about what they were paying for their 15K disk. So it really became a no-brainer for them. Once we proved that the product worked and it was stable back in 2010, you know, they've just been uh, been growing like a weed since then. So does eBay use dedupe or? Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much I can talk about their infrastructure because they're pretty sensitive about it. But I can I can <coughs> say that you know the dedupe is sort of viewed by our customers as the great the cherry on top, not not something that really drives their purchase. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about our go-to-market strategy. Uh, the company uh, really today is focused on building a, a channel. Uh, we launched a channel program in January called Flashpoint, uh, sort of combining flash and tipping point sort of in a, in a single word there. And if you're from Canada, that's actually the name of a show in Canada, I just found out. So uh, no intended uh, mix there. But uh, uh, that program is geared toward uh, storage-centric uh, solutions providers and companies that are delivering database and virtualization solutions. We've got about 15 partners there today. It is expanding. You know, I'm a big believer in, qu in quality, not quantity, in a, in a partner strategy. So this isn't going to be a, a boil the ocean, let's get 500 VARs to sell this product. It's very much going to be let's find the strategic <coughs> partners 
that are thought leaders and, and enjoy bringing differentiated technology. At the same time, let's give them a model where they can sell their own service. I think that's a, it's a key element in any partner program. So we don't force our customers or our partners to buy our service contracts for on-site service. They can buy a contract for, say, 24-7 tech support and escalation, and then sell their own service if they're in a capacity to do so. We'll train them for free as long as they make the investment in you know, spare parts and everything else that's needed in order to provide that. So uh, we don't have an OEM strategy at all. Uh, they can cause uh, a bit of conflict uh, to try to do both channel and OEM side by side. It's very challenging. Uh, partners don't like it, and it can create a lot of, uh, a lot of tough, uh, tough selling. Uh, we're in the U.S., of course, and Canada. Uh, we're also now international. Uh, we have partners in the U.K., the Netherlands, uh, Japan, uh, Poland, um, Belgium, uh, Norway. So we've got you know pretty pretty good pretty good coverage. Yeah, we do. Actually, uh, one of our SCs is about 30 minutes from the border. Uh, he's a, he's Dutch, but right there uh, in Belgium. I mean, you said in Belgium, huh? You said in Belgium. Belgium, yeah. Don't mention. It. Because uh, it <laughs> it's not him. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, and in, in terms of support, we have the 24-7 infrastructure. And if partners don't want to do their own service, we do have the parts depots to uh, provide that. But uh, that's something that's up to our partners if they want to offer that or, or offer their own.